a foretaste of spring, doesn't it? And, uh, and, and maybe some of you, when uh, the weather gets a little warm, you, you want to do a little spring cleaning. I was thinking about that yesterday as the snow was <coughs> melting. And I was tying it with the text that we have before us. I mean, here, Jesus is doing some spring cleaning. He's cleaning the church. He's cleaning the temple. I mean, today's text is about Jesus cleaning house. But he's doing more than just spring cleaning the church and the temple. He's repurposing the church and the temple. He's giving it a new purpose. He's cleaning his Father's house and pointing to something that even, is even beyond Jesus himself. So here's a picture that I want you to put in your mind this morning. Think of the property wall around our church. Think of our property. Think of the entire block. Think of, you know, think, uh, think of uh, 8th Street to, to 9th Street and then think of Pine Street, no, Chestnut Street to Pine Street. There we go. Got to get my directions uh, ready. So I want you to think of this whole, this whole block and, uh, and I want to think, I want you to think of this block with these huge walls around it because that's what the temple looked like in Jerusalem. It was a place of worship, but it was a place that had, was surrounded by all of these high walls around the perimeter. All the way around the temple, there were these high walls. And, and people now were coming because uh, John tells us that it was the Passover. People were coming to the temple for the Passover. And so think of that, people coming here from you know, Minneapolis and Rochester and uh, people coming from Milwaukee, people coming here from New York City, thousands of people that are, are gathered now around the church and, 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 and thousands of people and they're outside the walls, they're inside the walls, um, and the whole area is, is full of tables and people and animals, that's what it looked like because it was the Passover, a major holiday for those in Jerusalem and it is still a major holiday for the Jews of today. And Jerusalem was crowded to its capacity. Every room was full. The streets were crowded. Roman soldiers were out in full force. They were patrolling everything. And since every family was required to slaughter their Passover lamb, and some of you, I know, a few years ago you participated in the Seder meal that we hosted here. And remember we had lamb. Uh, we had lamb. Uh, we celebrated that because the Jewish family is required to slaughter an unblemished lamb, to provide a lamb, and then slaughter it as a sacrifice before they enter into the temple. So, uh, so just picture this: families coming, Jewish families coming, and they had all of they had all of their their animals, and there were tables, and and uh, uh, there were uh, animals in. In, in, in the parking lot, and, and it was crowded, and, and other sacrifices were also required at this time that John tells us about. So when Jesus entered the temple, he found it to look a lot like a marketplace. And it's not that Jesus was against the marketplace, it wasn't that Jesus was against you know, free trade. People would have to exchange their money. That was the money changers. And if you ever traveled out of the country, you know a little bit about what it's like to have to exchange your money for the current currency of, of the location that you're at. You know about this. It wasn't that Jesus was against money changers. I mean, they provided a service for those coming to worship God. They all provided a necessary service that was required by the Bible. It was required by the law of Moses. It wasn't that Jesus was against the law of Moses. What was Jesus against? Well, all of these tables and of people selling animals to sacrifice, I mean, that was also a necessary service. It wasn't that Jesus was against the sacrifices of animals. That was all part of the Torah, the law. I mean, it's difficult to travel with animals. Have any of you ever traveled with an animal? It's difficult to travel with an animal. People needed to be able to buy what was necessary for the sacrifice when they arrived at Jerusalem. And remember that they had to provide a lamb that was unblemished. So who would want to carry a lamb all the way from New York? You know, a journey walking that would take several weeks just to find that it didn't pass inspection once 
people are packed together and there's arguing and there's haggling and there's bleeding and there's cooing and there's crying and there's mooing. All of these things going on at the temple. Did you get the picture? Jesus is not necessarily angry with all of this stuff, with all of this commerce and buying and selling. It's that the people had gotten the impression that before you went into church that you had to buy your way into the temple. That's what Jesus was upset about. The impression that you could even think about buying your way into worshiping God. It was a system that seems to imply that if you paid enough money, that if you got a perfect enough animal, and if you had the right kind of cash, then you could get in to see God. Do you see something wrong with this picture? And so do you understand why Jesus was angry and agitated? My father's house is not a market, Jesus shouted. This is a house of prayer, a place where we meet God. It's not a place where money of any kind buys anything. And certainly not your ability to offer your prayers to my Father who is in heaven. When we come here, God looks for faith, not at your checkbook. God does not care how much you give or how perfect your lamb is. God cares that you are here. This is what made Jesus angry and agitated and so compassionate. So Jesus is making a very important point about the worship of God. If you want to come to God, you don't need money, you don't need an animal sacrifice, and you don't even need the temple. You don't even need the building, Jesus says. Because I am the building. I am the temple, Jesus says in the Gospel of John. God has come among you, and I am here to take you to the Father, Jesus says. So Jesus does some spring cleaning. Jesus cleans house. He pushes it all aside and out of the temple, the money changers, the pigeon sellers, and the sacrifices too. And he replaces it all with his own body, with his own blood. He comes to replace it all. He earns our way to the Father. He is the final and complete sacrifice for the sins of the world. Everything you see here, Jesus says, and everything that you see around you here in this place, in this temple of stone, is being replaced by the temple of Jesus' body. Jesus provides for it all. There's something else that we should pay attention to here, but I don't know if I really have a lot of time to get into it, but it's critical. It is so important to understanding this text, but you probably don't want to hear it. You probably listen to me long enough. You probably don't want me to go on to talk about what is critical and essential in understanding this text, do you? I don't think you I don't think you want me to keep preaching. I don't think I don't hear anybody saying keep preaching. I don't hear anybody saying, you know, I mean, I might have to hear that and, and give you what really is essential. Do you want to hear it? You don't want to hear it. You don't want to hear it. You do want to hear it. You don't want to hear it. You want me to sit down and stop preaching, don't you? What? All right. Here's the deal. All right. If you insist, you're in trouble. You guys are, you guys are in trouble. But there's something important to pay attention here in the gospel as well. Jesus teaching us about the temple. And remember what I said about the temple? Remember what I said about all the walls that were around the temple? Do you know what those walls were for? They were for keeping people out of the temple. So if you were a Jewish male, you would be allowed through the walls into the temple. But if you were a Jewish female, guess what? You were allocated to remain outside in the parking lot with the money changers and 
with the animals in the barnyard. That was your allocation as a female Jew. How do you feel about that, girls? Do you see something's going on here that is critical? And if you were a Gentile, if you were a person, as the gospel describes, from the nations, you would not be allowed inside the temple. You would be outcast. You would be outside the temple walls. You wouldn't be allowed inside at all. So you see, Jesus isn't just cleaning house, but he's making room. He's making room for everyone. He's opening the house, the temple, for everyone. He opens it for every person, for Jews and for Gentiles, for women, for men, for children, for rich, for poor, for those who are well, for those who are sick, everyone, the temple. That is Jesus Christ is for all people. All people. There are no walls. In fact, doesn't Jesus give us as one of his commands, go and make disciples, not of some nations. Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations. Who is God for? God is for all people. All people. The church does not exist, and this is really important. The church does not exist for the sake of the people who are inside. Sometimes we forget about that. It exists for the sake of the people who are on the outside. That is the reason the church exists. Because it's God's desire to be God of all people. Not just some people. That's why we exist as a church. The church is not just for us. The church is for everyone. So the message for today is really simple. It is really at the core of what we really should believe. Is that people matter to God. And which people matter to God? All people matter to God. All people matter to God. How much do people matter to God? Well, more than you can possibly imagine. They're worth the life of the temple. They're worth the life of his son, Jesus. Therefore, people matter to us, the church, right? People matter to us. Which people matter to us? All people matter to us. And how much do they matter to us? More than we can possibly imagine. And there's a reason Jesus got so agitated and angry. There is a reason for that. There is a reason that Jesus worked so hard to teach the folks this, and especially people who consider themselves people of the faith, the people of the spiritual community. There's a problem, you see. There's a dynamic in human life that goes way deep inside us. In fact, one of the foundational aspects of life that the whole discipline of sociology is built on is that human beings, you and I, join together in groups by nature. That we are tribal. That we separate ourselves between us and between them. Us and them. And that's not bad. I mean, God created us that way. That's not bad. God made us that way. But when all we do is tend to favor us over them, you see, that's when we run into trouble. That's when we run into trouble. There are all kinds of studies that have been done around this. This kind of us versus them mentality. In one of those studies, boys who were put in one of two groups based on something as random as a coin flip. Get this. They were selected together, chosen as random as flipping a coin. Complete random assignment. And they very quickly decided, those boys very quickly decided, that the boys in their group had better personalities than the boys in the other group. They very quickly decided that the boys that were just chosen in random were much smarter than the boys who were selected in the other group. Us versus them. Us versus them. You see, that's, that, that's, that's so ingrained in us. And some of you are here that you're not boys. You're not boys at all, are you? Some of you here are, are women, right? Some of you here are, are girls or are women, and you're thinking, well, that's just boys, right? That's what you're thinking right now. That's what boys do. Girls, you're probably thinking, would never do such a thing. They would never 
Let's stand and confess our faith.